I'm Ed Shaw, and I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. As long as I can remember, I have had an overarching goal in life, and that is to live a life that matters. I call it leaving footprints. My father built a house outside of uh, Omaha, and we were surrounded by cornfields. And uh, at the time that uh, the house was constructed in the early 1940s, I was just about two years old. And uh, I didn't have any playmates nearby. And so my sister and I had to find ways to entertain ourselves or learn from each other. And uh, as a result of that, I became very self-sufficient. Obviously, the city grew much uh, beyond where, where our house was, but in those early days of uh, childhood, it was making things in the workshop in the basement uh, or learning to play the piano. Uh, my mother always uh, told me that uh, I, I want you to be whoever you want to be. And I grew up with this this desire to be different. When I see young people today, it seems like they want to be like their friends, uh, but I grew up with a, an approach to life of, I want to be different. And I think that that has provided the, the, the motivation to do things that nobody else has done, to take risks that are associated with doing new things like that, but to do things that will change the world in a positive way. It's, it's the leaving footprints that drives me. The um, entrepreneurial flywheel here at uh, Princeton is spinning rapidly and it's gaining momentum day by day, month by month. A uniquely Princetonian form of entrepreneurial activity and understanding and involvement is uh, building on this campus and it's great to see. You can be an entrepreneur in any field if you're driven by this desire to produce new knowledge or to apply new technologies in ways that make the world better. So if I were to rec be asked to recommend to Princeton, well, what does entrepreneurship at Princeton mean? It's making the world better, uh, innovating, and uh, having th those activities take place all across the campus. Students here at Princeton uh, are living in a world of very rapid change, increasingly rapid change. Uh, this creates headaches for uh, people who are dependent upon the status quo, but it creates enormous opportunities for those who are able to anticipate change, to drive change faster, and to exploit the results of rapid change. The all-time great hockey player, Wayne Gretzky, when asked, Wayne, what makes you so good? He replied, I skate to where the puck will be rather than where it is. Entrepreneurs share a, a set of common characteristics. Uh, they're creative. Uh, they're dissatisfied with the ordinary and what has happened. They want to innovate and offer new ideas. They're uh, courageous because they realize that uh, when you do th new things, it doesn't always work out as expected, but you have to take the risks associated with innovation. If people want to be entrepreneurs, but they don't feel they have courage, I have some comforting advice. Naivete works just as well. That if you don't understand all of the things that can go wrong, and you venture into a new area, you look courageous, even though you may just be doing it through naivete. Entrepreneurs are dreamers. Uh, when they're driving on the freeway or in the shower, they're fantasizing about the future and their role in it. But 
they're not just dreamers. They're action-oriented. They want to just do it. Entrepreneurs are stubborn. Well, maybe the right word is determined. They, they realize that failure doesn't come from defeat. Failure occurs when you stop trying. If you never give up, you'll never fail. Entrepreneurs are leaders. There are very few things in life of substance, of importance, that can be done alone. You have to build a team. There are many, many books on leadership, but there's a characteristic that I look for in an individual to determine whether or not they're a true leader. Leaders give credit and take blame. Think about it. It's often so much the opposite. That when things go right, the person in charge says, I did it. And when things don't work out so well, others get thrown under the bus. I was in the Oval Office of Ronald Reagan when I was in Congress, and I noticed a framed quotation on his desk in the Oval Office. It read, there's no limit to what you can achieve in politics and life, so long as you don't care who gets the credit. Wanting to contribute to the world, doing things that haven't been done before, uh, that's what entrepreneurs do. Uh, entrepreneurship isn't about starting companies. Entrepreneurship is an approach to life. It's about starting new things from scratch. It's about making the world better through innovation and trying, sometimes failing, but then coming back and getting it right. You can be an entrepreneur in anything. Uh, and the satisfaction that you get by touching the lives of others in a positive way by creating something new that's valuable to them. And uh, the um, satisfaction that you get knowing that you've made the world better through whatever you've done that's new and, and different is the greatest satisfaction a human being can experience. When I came to the U.S. House of Representatives, one of the issues that I worked, wanted to work on uh, was an issue that affected my district directly, uh, the Export Administration Act. It had to do with export controls of technology products. And it turned out that the, that the Foreign Affairs Committee was the committee that uh, would uh, review the Export Administration Act and make any amendments in it. I got myself appointed to the Foreign Affairs Committee. There was only one Republican seat, but I was able to get that uh, appointment. And um, I was not able to get on the um, Trade Subcommittee, however. And that was the subcommittee of the Foreign Affairs Committee that would deal with the Export Administration Act. So I went to the Democratic chairman of the Trade Subcommittee and I said, is it okay if I kind of sit in on the hearings? And he said, this was Don Bonker from the state of Washington. He said, fine. And so I sat at the end of the day, yes, and uh, after a, a few hearings, he said, look, Ed, if you want to ask some questions of the witnesses, uh, go right ahead. And so I began asking questions at the, the various hearings. And pretty soon Don said, you know, you're sort of, getting a lot of information from your questioning that we haven't been getting. We, I'd like you to keep coming to these uh, hearings. To make a long story short, when the Export Administration Act was uh, passed by the House and the Senate passed a, an alternative version that didn't meet my criteria, Don Bonker came to me and said, Ed, whatever you decide is right. I will support, and this was in the conference with the uh, Senate, and uh, that's why, how we got the Export Administration Act passed with the provisions in it that I wanted on behalf of my constituents. Well, you can say, well, I didn't get on the subcommittee, so I guess I can't do anything, but the answer is even in the House of Representatives, you can be an entrepreneur by offering value to those who are in a position to do something with it. If you're uh, an entrepreneur in your community, 
you may be volunteering. If you're an entrepreneur and creating a nonprofit enterprise, you not, may not be creating great wealth, personal wealth for you or the people who are involved in the enterprise, but you're offering something to those who need it that they couldn't get otherwise. And that's where the satisfaction comes of seeing something in the world that's good that didn't exist before and knowing that it's there just because of you. One of the characteristics of creativity is putting together ideas that are normally not associated with one another. Uh, as a result, when I was in school here at Princeton, uh, I majored in philosophy and physics, a combination of science and thought. Uh, when I was uh, getting my PhD at Stanford, I took courses throughout the whole campus in chemical engineering, electrical engineering, in uh, statistics, in operations research. And I found as a result of that, that I could, by having a, a little bit of knowledge on a wide range of disciplines, I could put together ideas that are not normally associated with one another. So I've advised my students, rather than becoming real deep in a very narrow field, if they want to be entrepreneurs, is to have a true liberal arts education, to learn from uh, all of the disciplines that you have time for, and then even those that you don't have so much time for. Uh, because it will enable you to see the world in a way that those who have a m much more narrow lens won't be able to see it all. Students come to me and they uh, often want to talk about career choices and how they're going to pursue either their career here on campus or uh, after they graduate. Uh, and they're trying to put together a plan. And um, my advice to them is career planning is overrated. I never had a plan. But I had two guidelines. One do what you enjoy doing. So every day you wake up excited, passionate about what it is that you're engaged in. And two, do it the best you know how. So that you never have to look back and wonder how things would have turned out if only you'd really tried. I view teaching as public service. I view it as entrepreneur. And to a certain personal extent, I view it as father, too, because of the relationship that I've had with many, many students. Most students, uh, when they're taking a course with me and want to talk outside of the classroom, aren't asking about the course. They're asking me about life. That's how I spend most of my time with my students. Career choices, uh, courses of study, decisions they have to make. And I'm always surprised and somewhat disappointed in how much bad advice they're getting from others. Bad advice is sort of doing what everybody else is doing rather than doing what you want to do. Making as much money as you can rather than changing the world for the better. So I try to help them understand that whatever they decide, that's their personal decision, but that there are some criteria that they might apply to those decisions that can lead them in a direction that they'll be more proud of and more satisfied by. I invest with my heart rather than my head. Uh, I've started companies with former students upon graduation. Uh, no professional investor would invest in kids that have no experience building a company. But the joy that I get of working with these young people and watching them mature and achieve things that are beyond what people would have expected they could have accomplished 
that's, that's a thrill for me. Currently, I'm in, involved in six companies, uh, four of which I started. One of which is, one of the others is a public company that was started by one of my Harvard Business School students from the class of 1969, and I chair the board of that company. It's a public company. And, and then there are um, some companies that I've started that have had obituaries written for them. <laughs> so the, the four that I am currently involved in are not the only four I, I started. There are some that uh, don't exist anymore. Uh, the first company I started, System Industries, uh, I started in 1968, early 1969. Uh, and that became a public company in 1980 and, and then was later sold uh, years later to another company so it doesn't exist as a separate entity any longer. But uh, I've, had, I've had some what you might call uh, false starts, but there's learning that comes from that. And uh, one of the companies that I helped to start uh, the entrepreneur is uh, an entrepreneur who I backed and, and the company went bankrupt. And he came to me a couple of years after the bankruptcy and said, uh, I learned my lesson. I know how to do it right this time. And uh, w will you invest? And so I and a few other individuals invested money and this company is a real winner. So um, that in, in some countries and in some locales, uh, having a company that you start go bankrupt is a, a career killer. But uh, in this country generally, and Silicon Valley in particular, uh, oh, you started a company and it failed. You've learned a lot. You know, I'm going to back you now. So there's, there, th this is a, a, a wonderful place to be an entrepreneur. It's, uh, 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 there are a lot of people who uh, enjoy the process and the investing, but also recognize that um, there's a lot of learning that is needed. And if you've obtained that learning by trying and then having a setback, uh, that's okay. It may be better than reading a textbook. Typically, I will get emails from students that begin something like this. These are the ones that went to Wall Street or consulting firms. Dear Professor Shao, you were right, I was wrong. I'm unhappy here at Goldman Sachs and I want to leave. Can we talk about what, to, what I might do? And the answer is, I don't refer to the first part, you know, like, I told you so. <laughs> I just say, sure, let's talk. I'm often asked, are entrepreneurs born or can they be made? Frankly, I don't know the answer to that, but I have, based on my experience, a strong belief that every human being possesses a desire to do something beyond themselves. And what we can do here at Princeton is encourage, nurture that desire. One of the ways of doing it is to show each of our students that it's possible by demonstrating with role models and stories and examples that people just like you Princeton students just like you have done these incredibly creative, innovative things that, that matter. And then we can provide some tools because there are certain approaches to problem solving. There are certain uh, uh, techniques that can be applied in any kind of entrepreneurial activity. For example, uh, in most activities of uh, innovation that matter, you have to find a way to get money. And analyzing, well, how do I 
how much money do I need, how can I attract it, that process that may not be familiar to a Princeton student coming into the university can be taught. So if you can uh, combine both the, the promise of entrepreneurship that, yeah, it's possible, and unleash the um, human uh, uh, desire to do something new and make a difference in the world, and then provide the techniques and tools and approaches that uh, permit that to be done and done successfully, uh, anybody can be an entrepreneur. Where I'm living uh, these days in Nevada, it's, it's cowboy country. And uh, I like to listen to country music. And there's one song that I believe has advice for everyone, particularly for entrepreneurs. And the song is, don't call him a cowboy till you've seen him ride. Now you can apply that to anything. Don't call him uh, a scientist until you've seen what results he can produce. Don't call him an entrepreneur until he's made the world better. So don't call him a cowboy till you've seen him ride.